The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Welcome to the Growth Series, which we're cheekily calling Ensemble on Tour, recorded live at the Future Proof Festival in Huntington Beach, California. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and alongside Adele Martin, we're bringing you right into the heart of this one-of-a-kind outdoor wealth management festival. Across these episodes, we'll be sharing practice development and business growth insights, along with standout conversations, surprises, and key takeaways from some of the brightest minds in finance, fintech, and beyond. Get ready to hear who we met, what we learned, and what we're bringing back to Australia. Let's dive in. Alrighty, folks. Here with me is the lovely Adele Martin. Hello, Adele. Hello, Peter. <laughs> it's the end of day one at the Future Proof Festival here in Huntington Beach, California. We've both got a little bit of sun because we've just spent half the day. It was a short session today outside at an, the world's largest outdoor wealth management festival. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> to describe it, before we sort of dive in, to describe it, the best analogy I could give is if you held a conference, a financial advice, or sorry, broader, it's broader than that, isn't it? It's wealth management as well. Yeah. If you held it at like the wharves at Sydney, you know, those big long sort of along the waterfront where Barangaroo used to be, they used to have this like concrete massive wharf. It's sort of like that. This is like a concrete car park that runs along Huntington Beach. They've dressed it up, added massive music stages and booths and tents and all sorts of stuff, haven't they? It is. It is full on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's huge, folks. And to the point that if somebody's going to go off and, and get something from the other end of the festival, you know, they'll be back in sort of 15 minutes. It's not going to be I'm ducking out for a minute or two. We were lucky today. Day one was just sitting and, and listening to some sessions. So it was quite an easy day in that sense. And Adele and I managed to nab a couple of chairs under an umbrella and so we don't look as red and blistery as I think some other attendees might because it was full sun today folks so future proof Adele they said it was the third year right so this is pretty young it is it's only three years in Mm. but um I think it started a couple of years ago just before COVID right um and yeah kicked off with about 1700 people and this year they've got over 4,000 people there yeah and it feels like that doesn't it like it's an endless sea of faces you don't really recognise. Because no. normally at a conference you start to see similar people, like it doesn't feel like that just yet for us at Future Proof, but it certainly does have a chilled vibe. Mm. Everybody's dressed pretty casually. Um, I haven't seen a suit yet. Have you seen anybody in no a suit No suits yet? yet. No. So very different in that sense. But that said, similar in that there's tents with BDMs, with their, you know, swag and all that sort of stuff like you would expect, just far more of them, I guess, than we used to. Yeah, a lot more. A lot more. So what we'd love to do, folks, is just sort of take you through some of the highlights of what we saw and experienced today. Um, And there were a few sessions. We're not going to cover them all. I think the first one that both of us sat up a bit straighter at as he started talking was the gentleman from Daffy. Um, His name was Adam Nash. And he's got this this sort of newish offer, but he's also an adjunct lecturer at Stanford. So, you know, completely unsuccessful, not. (laughs) (laughs) And this was interesting, wasn't it? So these are, and please jump in, Adele, this was a new concept. It's not something that exists in Australia just yet. No. They call them donor-advised funds. So basically my take, and every listener here is going to start Googling them and they're going to, you know, type in and tell me I got this wrong. So I'm okay with that, folks. So please dig into this. But basically a donor advice fund lets let somebody in the US put money aside as like a personal giving goal each year mm-hmm. into this type of product that lets them get an immediate tax deduction, but they don't actually have to apply that money immediately. It sits in this special type of fund and then they can decide where the money goes later. So they don't have to rush to make a donation to a particular charity or anything like that now. It lets them sort of build a pool of money like their own little trust. 
yeah. right? And then apply that, you know, down the down the track, which sounds really cool, right? As part of your planning for a client, imagine having a charitable giving goal. Yeah. Think- and what I loved about with Daffy is they had the idea that you could invite your family members onto the, into the app too, into the app as well. And so, family that especially if you've got you know younger Gen Zers who you know that's really important to them, the idea of philanthropy and, and giving to have them involved in the money conversation with the family about where this money is going. I think that was great. I also love that it made money not this evil thing. Like so yes. often there's such a bad story about money and, and like to show your young family that money can do good. Uh, I love that concept of being able to in- incorporate your children in those conversations about what to do with the charities. Right. So to be able to, so what this means is our understanding is the, so this is a tech play, even though it's got investing and, and, and um, tax around it, but it's really a tech play. And so they can, you can have anybody join you. So you could have a large family all in the same, in the same app and they can volunteer suggestions. Mm. Oh, I came across this charity thing or our school's doing this, you know, as long as it's not for profit and meet certain requirements, then it could be all sorts of things you could donate money to. They then took that even further, which I thought was super cool, which was you can set up a matching campaign. So you might want to honour you've just, you know, there's a good mate that's just passed away from some horrible thing and you want to raise money in honour that. You can say, well, I'm going to match any money that or up to a certain level the money that we we collect together, right? And so that can all go through this app. So instead of just the $10,000 donation you may have made to the Breast Cancer Foundation, whatever it is, then you can actually have other people contribute to that and and match it up to the 10K. So it's sort of a really interesting way to get people to focus on where they do their giving. Um, And I love the idea that this could be one of the goals we work on with clients. Yeah, I do too. Like, I love so it. So interesting. Now, there was all sorts of trickiness too for tax reasons that, well, look, we can't go into because we don't know whether you could do it in the, in the well, Australia. Well, yeah, somewhere. I don't, but what I love, I don't think you could do it in Australia, but I love <laughs> it. You could gift assets into it. Yes. That had capital gains taxable already. Right. And when so you, low cost base yep. shares. So say so you've yeah. had, like mum and dad have had shares for a bajillion years, their CBA and their whatever they've had yep. forever. You could move those into this product or the Daffy, and then cash could be applied to rebuy those shares at the higher cost base. So you could be making a tax play. Yeah. So that was a sort of a side that he mentioned. Um, well, and I, I took it, maybe I got this wrong, that there'd be no CGT. You get the CGT waived on them by bringing the asset in. You lo- That's the, the play that I took from it. Potentially because it's then charitable as well. Yeah. So it's, yeah, so you're replacing a. CGT potentially heavy asset yeah. with a new one that's a fresh one and and moving it into an environment where it doesn't – now, of course, who knows whether that would be possible in Australia. But to be honest, even the first level where you're just collaborating on charity give, like I just think that is fantabulous. And it could be as, as granular as, as your kid's school mm. or the local – What you know, it could be really local mm. as long as it met certain requirements. So – I mean, for sure, I'm reaching out. There's an email here we've got that um, I'd love to reach out and find out what the dynamic, how that could work. Because mm-hmm. I don't know about anybody else, but I'd love to have that as part of a review meeting. Mm. How cool would that be? Yeah. What are you doing with your charity if you right? pick this year? Yeah. I think it'd be fabulous. And I think for this intergenerational wealth transfer we're all talking about, some of that money is going to go to charities. Mm. So why not, like you say, involve your adult kids in that discussion? Mm. Make it real. Make them take part. Well, they, they said also they see a huge surge in donations right before tax time. Yes. Like on the 31st, of their, their, their tax year is calendar year. So yeah. on the 31st of December, whole heaps of money Flow goes of money. To, into this. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, Aussies love a tax deduction. If you can do good with it at the same time and right. choose your good. But, so and wait decide. where it goes. So yes. just put it in here and then you can take your time. Yeah. Find 10 different things. Don't just go and slap it onto one thing just yeah. because you're in a hurry for tax. Yeah. Yeah, I, it just really stood out. I thought that was super interesting. So the next one up that was, <laughs> it was interesting. Now, we are both tech curious people, right? We love our tech. And we do want to keep this a bit growth and, and practice management focused. But they had a gentleman, from a senior exec from Google on stage, and they were talking about AI and wealth management. And there was a few interesting things that came out of that as sort of themes, wasn't there? Um, one of the ones that stood out was they all had the view that 
legacy CRMs as we know them um, are going to be massively disrupted by AI. And the reason they gave was because AI can see through multiple sources of data. It can see, and when they say data, they mean videos, recordings, text, PDFs, like, and your CRM. So it, there's going to be this massive disruption. Um, hence, groups or, or apps like Salesforce, HubSpot, those sort of people are investing in understanding this because they can see it could completely nullify the basic CRM. I thought that's interesting. Mm. You know? I also think what stood out that he said was he didn't think that advisors were going to be replaced by AI and robo. Yeah. He, he, he thought that, the, and we already saw that. We already saw that robo didn't take off didn't how quite. people thought they were going to take off. Mm. He thought that, yes, AI will have a place in investment, but it'll be advisors using AI. In rather, the engine room, right? Yeah. Yeah. Rather than the public going direct. He said, so I yeah. thought that that was, you know, interesting that, you know. Absolutely. You know. And that came across consistently was this is going to be the machine behind you. This is going to be the thing that can just get so much more done in much shorter time frame. Yeah. I think the word what you're going to be, it's going to be the creator and you're going to get to be the editor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Super interesting. And I think the other expression they used, and it's something they said that, um, all of the apps and tools and everybody into trying to work in the tech stack now is using. So I figure it's something we should probably all learn to look out for is AI can help us know what the next best action is. Mm. So you could be sitting in something that can look across all of, all of the different things your client had, like we've got data for our client for, and it'll say, you know what, you should probably pop them an email because. So it's going to be able to predict what we should be doing so that we optimize our time and can do things in a really impactful way mm. as opposed to just um, mass batching way, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Although, can I say conversely, we both commented on this. He talked about the, the Google, I talked about five ways he saw wealth management taking advantage of Gen AI. And he said this, the first one was operational efficiencies. And I, I think, you know, the appropriate response is duh. Um, but he then said client experiences, and I think both you and I are like, woo, and we're like lent in. But when he said client experiences, he then went, yeah, like creating proposals or portfolio optimization. And we're like, that's not a client experience. No. Like, <laughs> so interesting that at least it's everywhere, right, where we mistake what we deliver as the experience. Mm. And it simply isn't. So I thought that was actually pretty interesting too. Um the only other tip he did give was that for lots of us in smaller practices, we're not going to have gener generative AI doing everything for us yet, but we can start being ready. So having really well-organized um, cloud-based servers of the client info. So where, you know, each client has a place where their stuff is and it's because if it's all easy to index, then when the right tool comes along, it'll just be able to read all of that. So if you can have, whether it's the folder per client or whatever, like being really organized about where the information is in something that's a cloud service, um, he said that'll do you huge favors. When the right tool comes along, they can just read that in a heartbeat, which is pretty cool. Mm. So after that, we had a couple of sessions, but, oh, that's the right. The next one was the, we both liked, was the future of the wealth management industry discussion. Mm. Before we dive in. I think there's a good chance that also we were pretty excited about that session because it was a, you know, future of the wealth management industry, but it was a female host and there was three female panelists, which I don't think I've ever seen for a panel session that isn't actually about women. Would mm, you agree? Yes. I don't think I've ever seen that no. before. So that was nice, right? Yes. It was nice to see that um, as a bit of a, dis a difference. This was talking a lot about, you know, what are the driving tailwinds and headwinds and they all said yeah the biggest tailwind is AI like they all just said like that's the thing that's going to be pushing us mm. but once again conversely the biggest opportunity well sorry the biggest headwind they saw was scaling you know really working out ways to scale your business yeah yeah I found what they still had the same struggles that we had which was a lot of advisors here struggle with organic growth mm. they said their organic growth on average was only three percent 
which is pretty dismal 3%. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, so they, we, they spoke about why do you think some of those reasons why it is so low. And one of them was, yeah, with the they need to serve more clients per advisor. Yeah. And they're, they're only going to ever be able to do that through, you know, technology. And so, yeah, I think that was that was interesting that they still were struggling with the same organic problems. Yeah. Uh, the other problem that she said was that she found in her business that made them successful was to let people that were good at rainmaking do it. Yes. And so often I see that in Australia where we force someone to do a role that they're not – doesn't like it's not their natural like yeah, yeah it's not their natural default and so I think making sure you've got the right people in the right roles rather than trying to force someone into a role I think that was the other um, you know important takeaway that I had as well yeah and there was um, one of the panelists said they'd done a lot of analysis I think they were they don't use the word dealer group but I think they were like a large dealer group equivalent so they were looking a lot at, at how efficiency and and roll out of tech and all that sort of thing works and. Um, they said that their research shows that the average advisor is only using 5 to 10% of the features of the apps they're already paying for. So, like, they keep on going, oh, we should use this new app, and oh, we should be in there. Whoa, 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 whoa. You've got 90% of value you're already paying for. Should we not make sure you're extracting that value? Um, so I think that's an, that's an important lesson. You know, to if you're paying for it, start, you use it already. Get the value now. Once again, though, like our, our industry, there was a, a lot of conversation about pricing. You know, do, do we need to be able to bring the pricing down? Is there pressure on that? You know, just like for us. Um, and the panel universally agreed that they don't think pricing's the issue. They think value is. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's an interesting yeah. positioning. Yeah, no, I also found that their stats they said about that 74% of women change advisors 12 months after they're widowed, uh, which I thought was a huge stat. <laughs> so if you think about advisors listening, if you have an aging, you know, popular, uh, aging client base and we know that women live longer, that's a big risk that they're yeah. not, they're not leaving the advisor. They're, changing they're changing advisor. and yeah. it's the kids that are deriving that and the kids are looking at things like, you know, it, your website, what does your website look like? What technology are you using? Do you have online chat available? Right. And so it's those. How easy it, is it for us to have a family meeting all of us in different spots? Like how, you know, are you facilitating all of that? Yeah. So yeah. Like that was, um, yeah, that was, I think, stood out to me as a, as a risk that for, you know, advisors in Australia need to be aware of. Yes, absolutely. Overall, um, just just on that, the other thing that has stood out so far, I mean, folks, we're only in day one of this conference, but they, I would say as a group, they are so focused on investing in structures. So Adele and I were chatting on the bus on the way back and I I don't think I heard a single, aside from the charity giving, giving concept, I don't think I heard, I've heard a single goals based advice type of language, you know, that sort of thing that we see a lot of. I'm not seeing any yet. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And I think we said that we thought the reason was that they don't have compulsory superannuation. Yeah. So they have to have investments as more Lean of a focus. That. Yeah. yeah. They've got to sort of get that started um, for sure. Uh, so then the last lot of session, uh, you know, appealed to both of us <laughs> very much. This was the fintech demo drop. Yeah. Seven minutes each app for seven fintechs. And they had narrowed that down. Was it like 200? It was some ridiculous number of applications they got. They narrowed down to this seven. Uh, and so they just had to come up and pitch. And they were very sharp, very polished. Right. V- very, it was very great to listen to just from a presentation point of view about how they just articulated their message. The, what I love they did was they started with what the problem was. Yes. And so this is so often I see even advisors do with their marketing. They talk about the solution, but yeah. solutions have no value unless they've got a problem associated with them. All of them were very good at nailing what the problem was that they sold, and they did that very quickly in their first, like, 30 seconds to yes. a minute. Yes. There was a handful that we really, really uh, – well, sorry, that we sort of really liked. You partic- you liked Finney, right? Finney AI? Yeah. I thought Finney was interesting. Now, I don't know if we'd be able to get this here just with 
our laws here, but it basically went to like 300 million, a database of 300 million. It had all of this data about them. And so it could do personalized outreach to them. So as in it knew based on things like, and you just had, if someone just had a baby or it knew if they just got divorced or they just sold a business. And so when it did their marketing campaign, whether that's cold outreach on phone or email or LinkedIn, it was super personalized. And so, uh, and she demoed it live and showed us how much information live you could find out about a person, like what habits they're into, you know, whether they like golf. And she live demoed it. It was, we, we looked at each other a bit freaked out, actually. We did, actually. The, the words out of my mouth were, I, that's really creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think, I think what they're doing is trawling all of the social media yes. and connecting it. Yes. So the things they're saying on LinkedIn versus the things they post on Instagram versus the stuff they do on Facebook, like I think that it's, it's collating all it of is. it, right? Yep. Um, which, like we say, it's a little creepy. But the other thing, though, it did highlight for me is – how impactful, even for clients, if, let's just translate that from prospects, people we don't know, to people we do know, our clients. Imagine how much better our comms would be, and we'll get to that later with one of the tools that they find, if you could really capture some of that personalization, making your your communications deeply personal. Mm. Now, clearly that's going to work better, isn't it? It's going to connect better. So that sort of this personalization thing came through as a theme, didn't it? It did. With, yeah. With marketing, with communication to client, current clients for marketing, yeah, yeah. definitely this personalized. Across the board. So dispatch was the next one. Uh, so, yeah, we, I mean, on the fly, folks, we pick these up in seven minutes. So please excuse us <laughs> if we don't explain these well. But this is a tool that connects data across your tech system. So do you remember the app? So it was like your yeah. Salesforce with your analysis tool, with even where you invest your clients? Yeah, the applica- everything was seamless. Yeah, so it's sort of saying, hey, if you update info in one place, we're going to make sure it's updated everywhere else. And information is only ever captured once. It's yes. not ever re-entered more than once. All the, it'd be like if you're, you had like a marketing CRM, like, you know, HubSpot or something, and that spoke to X plan and X plan spoke to net wealth of CFS. They all talked together Correct. and nothing had to be re-entered. And he, he did an application and set up a client in the system in like 30 seconds. It was like a click, click and, on a button. And, and it took, took it even further to the, and what I mean by that is, look, we've all got to do ID checks, right? Mm. Well, when somebody gives you ID, and it gets scanned in, say, they were scraping the data off the ID, so that got put in without you having to enter it so you could just check it. So that once again, it's even reducing the the stuff you have to enter in even once yes. because it's catching that That's stuff. That's right. Right? Yeah, taking, so, so clever. Yeah, taking the, that was good. Taking the photo driver license and that going on your phone manager application, in your, you know, your CRM, everywhere. Yeah. And then if they change the address – doesn't matter which system, any one of the three systems you could change it, it in and it would updated. update across all three, yeah. which is crazy. And it had the change log. It said, oh, yeah. that got changed here and then here. And so dispatch was interesting. Um, the next one, I think probably. Our favourite. Yeah, yeah, if we could have done really a little happy favorite. jig in the aisle. But what's, what's cool tomorrow is they're going to they have all these techs set up and we can go play with them. They've got yes. like a little tech booth that we can They don't know what they're in for, do yeah. they, Dell? We're going to go have a live play with this one tomorrow. Bunk in the, in the tent. So the next one's called Jump AI. And we would describe it as an AI file note tool on steroids. Yeah, and they. They described it, which I like, just in terms of a mental shift, as an AI assistant for mm. financial advisors because what this is doing is instead of looking at a meeting file note taker, right, as a function, this tool is saying there is activity that happens pre-meeting, there's activity that happens during the meeting, and there's activity that happens after the meeting. Let's use AI to nail all of that. Yes, which is interesting, right? And when you think about the totality of that time you take, we're talking a few hours each time yes. of through all that. And so before a meeting, as an example, and I'm jumping to this one just because it really stood out for me, imagining it, and I, I think this only works if you've been using it for a bit. So let's say you've been using it for some client meetings. Then if it knows you've got a meeting coming up, it generates this pre-meeting briefing document. Mm. saying, oh, look, here's the summary of the things that have happened before. Um, here's the things that you said the client needed to do before the next meeting or you did, but this interesting one we both reacted to, suggested conversation starters 
And it started, don't forget about, and the example they had was, oh, they've just got a new puppy and it's destroying the house or something. Mm. Don't forget to bring that up. How fabulous is that? Yeah. For, for me, this was how you could see 300 people per advisor. Yes. It, these, this was the tool I'm like, this is going to give people that scale yes. because you can't have that personalization and remember everyone. No. And so it was the sort of stuff I think is going to be, you know, the game changer. Absolutely. So then, so it preps you, right? So then you do the meeting and it's, and you can have what was interesting is that I think they were pretty agnostic about where the meeting was. It could be Google Meet. It could be. Yep. Of any of any of the tools, Microsoft Teams or whatever you like, Zoom, they really didn't mind. It then takes that recording, turns it into a proper meeting note. So not just a transcript, um, you could turn it into a proper note and you could really give it an indication of how you wanted that to be structured. Yeah, you, you can know? customize the back of it. Absolutely. But I love that it also read it and picked up tasks from it which I think is great, but then it just went that next level and it could push the task into your CRM. Yes. So there was no more like copy and pasting stuff from here into there. It Remember like to ask it. your admin to do this. It just – It just ended up in your CRM. So exactly. It, and did the same with email. Again, it didn't just create the email summary to the client. It let you send the email summary connected to Outlook. Like yeah. it just went that next step to make things even easier. And particularly tailored for financial advice, meaning the notes had sections on – financial data, fact find data, but also even they called it time horizon yes. triggers, like things they talked about that are going to have down the track that might impact what you do for them, which I thought was really clever. Mm. Um, the other thing we – so there was two other things that were interesting. They had – so should you want to go back? You're like, mm, what exactly did they say then? I want to make sure. Maybe it's a quote you want to put in the SOA. Mm. So then if you went to the note, so the, the note it's produced – and go to a section there, it'll it'll bring up for you a quote of what they said. And if you still want to listen, it'll actually play what they said. Mm. So it's really letting you dive in to get really deep back into the note without having to listen to the whole recording. I mean, that's what we'd all have to do now. Yes. You know, just listen to the whole recording again, you know, all hour or whatever it is. And that part of it, this whole look back into a meeting – it had a chat function for that, so you could ask it questions about the meeting. Yeah, it's like a mini oh, chat GPT. Just for that meeting. I also love the analytics feature that it had. So yeah. this, for me, is that training. And I think as an advisor, for me, I always think that we should treat ourselves like professional athletes. And professional athletes watch their games back. They want to get better. And so this is what this tool allows you to do. It yeah. does stuff like what was your talk time, but also it lets you, and this is what I think if you had a team, if you wanted to do some oversight, this tool would be interesting because it lets you know when did things like consent, was there consent in yeah. there? Uh, was things like the sentiment, did the mood change? Like, talk time, who talked the most? Yeah, there's, there's, right? the analytics I think will be fascinating both for, for you and also if you have a team. Absolutely. And and as we were saying on the way back actually for the conference, the minute you turn on something that the team knows knows is watching that, their behaviour instantly changes. So if they know then that the machine is is monitoring, say, talk time, and they know that the reason it's monitoring that is we want to have the clients talk more than us, they'll start being more aware of that mm. even before they get the data, mm. right? So you really do get what you measure. Um, and so I think those analytics, they even had keyword tracking, which yes. I think is interesting. Um, so I think, and think that this is like version 1.0, like imagine where this can go mm. once it gets smarter and smarter. Um, so I thought, yeah, jump AI, well, we both did a little jump, I think. Yes. Uh, in reaction to that particular one. And the last one, you want to cover this, the financial, they call it. Yeah, themselves. financial. And this wasn't just a theme that came up here. This was something that came up a few times in the other presentations was the idea of having a app. Uh, that would be white labeled. And so uh, the idea is that the advisor should be in your pocket. I think they said buzzing in your pocket or something yeah. or vibrating in your pocket. <laughs> um, and so like, and they made this very, uh, this somewhat sad statistic that people spend about five hours a day on their phone and they're looking at it 96 times a day. So every 10 minutes people are picking up their phone and what they're looking for is things like messages and socials. And what I thought the this app particularly did well was it was like people – it was a way for the advisor to update, you know, their current clients, 
but it did it like in a social feed. It was mm. very similar style to how Facebook, people would scroll Facebook or Instagram, but it yeah. was an update from the advisor. Yeah. And so the other thing that I thought that he did, and so for me, just this whole thing of we can't just have a client portal because this is what this was, a fancy client portal. We yeah. have to have a client portal that that's enables an push app. an app. Yes. Can, we, can we just stress that to anyone yes. that's in the techno space listening? <laughs> has to be an app. We have to be able to do push notifications. Yes. Otherwise, it's um, you know useless. And You've so, got to be able to interrupt through. So, there was a lot of talk about the noise, the level of emails, the distraction. Like everybody's dealing with that, and I think we've all experienced that. Where the client says, oh, "I never got that email," they clearly did. Yeah, didn't open it. Um, the yeah, you've got to be buzzing in their pocket. I completely agree. Huge. And the other thing that they did well again. Hopefully, we get to demo how they did it. Was it, they had a section that made it easy for people to be able to refer their friends to you? Mm. So I'm going to check that out tomorrow to see how they exactly were. But they reckon there was an increase in referrals because people was now with this app easier for people to refer. Yes. And so, but also these apps then became a conversation starter. They said that the people were at dinner and they were like, you know, bragging about their financial advisor having this app. And the other people were saying, well, my advisor doesn't have this app, but then they could refer. So it became something that people like, you know, talked about. And so, yeah, there was definitely this theme throughout the day of the importance of an app for the advisor to be able to stay, you know, connected to their clients. Yeah. I think those days of, you know, you seeing a client once a year and that's the only conversation they have and you think a generic email newsletter that goes out, it's just not going to cut it with this, especially with, you know, younger clients coming through. Yeah. They want that more personalization and that's what this does. Yeah, 100%. So uh, that was broadly the day. Um, the, yeah, like I said, my overarching thing is there's a lot of talk, you know, there's a lot of personalization of investing, like they're going deep into that not as goals heavy. We'll see if that continues. Maybe maybe won't. Tomorrow will be super interesting, folks. So today was just these sessions we were watching. Tomorrow, there's two things they do quite differently um, as part of Future Proof, and they call them mm, breakthrough talks and breakthrough meetings. Did yes, I get that right? Yeah. Okay, so breakthrough talks are where, as part of the process of deciding to go, you suggest topics you're interested in, and they will try and put you on at least one or two of these tables where – six to eight of your peers will be there and you talk about that topic, right? So I've got one tomorrow that's about, you know, practical applications of AR or something. Yes. And we're all going to chat about it. So that's an interesting concept, right? So so A, you meet a few people because you actually have a conversation and B, share ideas, uh, which is cool. Then they have this thing, this breakthrough meetings thing, which is more, it's sort of like a professional dating service. And I mean, not dating, but... I'm having, like tomorrow, I think I've got five or six of these one-on-one meetings. So, you know, I said, oh, what type of conversations would I like to have for, with people? And I picked a couple of categories. They get to then say, hey, I'd like to meet with you, Peter, and I accept or deny them. And then they, the times are just booked in. So it's, but it's, did they say 15 minutes? I feel like I think it's 15 minutes. Yeah. So sit down, talk for 15 minutes. Next. Yes. <laughs> I'm imagining there's probably a bell that's going to ring and then up we get and move to the next <laughs> table. So... We don't know what that's going to be like. We don't know if that's going to be good or bad. I can't wait to report back tomorrow evening um, on how that goes. There will also be other sessions we'll be attending, but it's certainly different. Uh, it is unlike any conference I've been to. Would you agree? Yes. I haven't been to another conference where they had uh, puppy walking or <laughs> as an activity, but, yes, <laughs> certainly not another financial planning conference. No, absolutely. Uh, So we'll look forward to checking in tomorrow, folks, and letting you know how we go.